Welcome. My name is Judd Devermont. I am the director of the Africa program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And it is my pleasure to host Zach Burton here today to discuss his book, A Rope from the Sky, The Making and Unmaking of the World's New Estate. I think this is a room that maybe knows Zach quite well. But just for those of you who don't, he's a writer, foreign policy analyst, former US diplomat, worked for the International Crisis Group, was the policy director uh, for the Special Envoy to Sudan, South Sudan, during the Obama administration. And he's a visiting fellow now at Brookings in Doha, where he, and he also teaches at Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. Um, I have a couple of questions that I'm going to pose to Zach. Uh, but if you've read his excellent book, you know that he interweaves his own story into the story of South Sudan's uh, rise and maybe not fall, but decline. And um, I thought that that may be an opportunity to tell a little about my story. Um, I don't have the long history with this country that Zach does. Uh, I was parachuted into working this issue in December of 2013, and then in a different capacity, was responsible for doing a lot of the briefings in 2016 and 2017. So I don't know South Sudan's story the way that Zach does. I really only know it as a tragedy. So this was an incredible opportunity for me to read this book and to hear from Zach and learn the, the longer trajectory of South Sudan. Um, it's not only that he provides this background to understand where South Sudan is and where it may be going, but I think he paints this really complex picture of the South Sudanese people, its leaders, and its foreign uh, partners and allies. So we're going to get right into it. And I think. Zach asked some really hard questions about South Sudan's past, present, and future uh, in his book. And I encourage you, uh, when we move into the question of answers, <laughs> to do the same. So Zach, first, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, I do want to say something about Judd who, here, who's uh, both a colleague and a, and a friend. And uh, that is, uh, I, like many others in the Africa community around Washington, am very excited about the new chapter here at CSIS. And, if you haven't been paying attention, Judd has really, um, uh, really kind of brought a lot of renewal uh, to CSIS and to uh, kind of thinking about Africa creatively. And so uh, I'm grateful really to be here. Thanks, Judd. My pleasure. And we decided to wear the same outfits. Yeah. Uh, just um, it's what we do here. It's a lot of coordination. <laughs> um, but uh, Zach, why don't we start off with what does a rope from the sky mean? The title, um, A Rope from the Sky. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> in the Nilotic folktales, uh, the sort of ancient folktales of South Sudan, the earth and the sky were once linked by a rope. And that meant that the South Sudanese people uh, could travel up and down that rope. And they had access to the gods and to the heavens and to eternal life. Um, but tragically, uh, on account of human error, um, that rope was severed. And it meant that the people were forever resigned uh, to the difficulty and to the suffering uh, and the mortality that is the human condition. And um, I came across that fable uh, somewhere along the way in eight or nine years in South Sudan. And the interesting piece is that it's, um, it's a story that exists across many cultures in South Sudan. Uh, so on this tour, I've been talking to various folks. And you hear different iterations of the story among the Dinka culture, the Nuer, uh, the Shilluk, and others. Um, so uh, I think it's a beautiful story and in some ways uh, a sad one and, and fitting for this book in some ways because it too is a story of paradise lost. So we were outside, Zach and I, and talking to Ali. And you said that you had thought about writing this book. Maybe it was hatched way back in 2011 when it was going to be just the making of South Sudan. All right, volume one, and uh, ultimately you've written volume two and volume three in this in this book. So can you tell us a little bit maybe more about why you decided to write this book? Yeah, so um, I kind of put this right up front uh, in the author note in that um, Sudan, I think, is uh, for many people a faraway place. Uh, not necessarily in the Washington community or among this crowd, um, but it's really a faraway place, uh, hard to identify with, and yet uh, often among African issues at least, uh, people know something about it. It registers widely in popular consciousness, maybe because of its uh, turbulent history and because of this special relationship with the United States that we'll talk about. So whether that's Darfur or it's 
George Clooney or it's uh, the Lost Boys, uh, uh, you know, who escaped war and, and famine and uh, many of them, some of them child soldiers and, and made it to the United States. Um, people know those stories. Uh, what I don't think was really fully fleshed out was this full trajectory, right, of South Sudan's righteous liberation struggle, uh, this euphoric high of independence, and uh, sadly, its devastating collapse in 2013. So I think and hope that this is first a South Sudanese story uh, about its uh, people and about these events uh, and about hope and about struggle and about uh, triumph and ultimately, um, uh, hopefully also about redemption. Um, but it is also a story about the United States and American foreign policy, I think, at its best uh, and at, uh, not at its best. Um, and uh, that story sort of runs throughout. So people also know in some ways about this unprecedented coalition that included uh, sort of uh, left and right, included three U.S. administrations, included uh, Christians in the Bible Belt, and included the Congressional Black Caucus, and included advocacy and human rights groups, and, and included Hollywood celebrities, right? So there is this um, very outsized role played by the United States in the making of South Sudan. Um, and it's, a, it's an important role and it's a positive role and it's also uh, one that I think warrants uh, critical reflection. Um, and so this is, uh, I hope, uh, one attempt, one um, modest contribution to a discussion about lessons learned. Um, and I don't think we're very good at that. Yeah. I, I think we talk about that a lot. I think we uh, pull meetings together. I still don't think we're very good at lessons learned. Um, and I think we're particularly bad at lessons learned when it comes to Africa. Right, I, I don't think it's, I, st I still think it's not taken as seriously as some other regions. Um, and I certainly th think Sudan is a prime case where um, this huge constituency that supported um, this important cause uh, has not yet fully uh, reconciled or come to terms uh, with our own role there, good, bad, and otherwise, so. Good, well, I, I really wanna get back to, I wanna talk about the role of US advocacy in, in South Sudan's trajectory, but I think even though in, in this room and maybe on webcast, you have a lot of experts uh, who, you, who were in the trenches with you at different points. But just so we're all on the same page, uh, can you give us a little uh, thumbnail of uh, what happened in South Sudan and South Sudan that got us to this point? Sure. Um, yeah, the thumbnail version is uh, there's, there's uh, successive civil wars in Sudan, the Africa's largest country. Um, over uh, several generations, and most notably between the 1980s and leading up to 2005, uh, when there's a comprehensive peace agreement that ends uh, this war, uh, which is in some ways between Sudan's north and south, and uh, importantly, is also between Sudan's center and its peripheries, uh, not only the south, but Darfur and other regions. Um, so 2005 is the first date to know. After that, uh, as many of you surely know, there's a six-year trial period uh, where South Sudan is either going to sort of, um, there's a, they're going to continue dating. And at the end of six years, South Sudan is either going to stay in continued union or secede. Um, and as we know, in 2011, 99% uh, of Southern Sudanese vote uh, to, for self-determination to exercise their own political destiny uh, to create a state in South Sudan. And this is when the whole world is watching. And um, the map of the world is redrawn, and, and Barack Obama is among the first to uh, acknowledge uh, South Sudan as an independent state. Uh, and then, as we'll surely talk about, sadly, the last date to remember is two 2013, uh, on to the present, when um, uh, the hope, this incredible promise and hope about a new state in South Sudan is dashed, and the attempts since to sort of um, recover the shards of the shattered dream. So I, I only know you through policy meetings, largely, and occasionally, some drinking holes, but um, I was really surprised in the book. You, I mean, it, it's actually alive, right? I mean, there's the, the just the opening itself. You're not Jack Ryan, but you definitely have this action scene to it, right? Like it's got, it's it's alive. And if, I thought, if the best way for us to talk about today is to just talk a little bit how you the prologue and how you frame the story. Sure. Um, so. Uh, I learned a lot along the way, and, and the story is told in many ways through South Sudanese characters. Um, uh, I show up sort of only as a set of eyes, uh, not as a Jack Ryan character. There's uh, a lot of you like getting on planes, jumping <laughs> off planes. I mean, it's well, we'll come back not to with that. a parachute, but. We'll come back to that. But um, 
So we begin with a character right up front, a, yeah. a young man named Simon. And this is the prologue of the book um, where uh, the night the violence began, the state I've referenced, December 15th, 2013. Um, Simon is a young man, a, an ethnic newware from a place called Akobo in the eastern part of Sudan. Uh, and he is falling asleep in his shack on the north side of Juba, uh, and he hears gunshots. And he hears more and more gunfire, and over the course of that night, uh, it gives way to heavy machine guns and to mortar shells, and ultimately to tanks uh, rumbling down the streets uh, of the capital city in Juba. And uh, Simon uh, is a secondary school student who uh, grew up in neighboring Kenya in, in a refugee camp. Uh, and has returned to South Sudan in 2011 again, uh, like so many others, excited by the promise of, of a new beginning. Um, but Simon knows over the course of the next 24, 36 hours that he won't be going to school the next day. And um, a long story short, um, Simon is forced to make a decision that night that so many other su Southern Sudanese made. Um, there are government hit squads out targeting members of his own ethnic community, and uh, he makes a run for it and he tries to reach uh, the camp of the UN peacekeeping mission that's already uh, exists in South Sudan. And it's a harrowing journey to get there. And he comes within inches of his life. And when he arrives, he finds thousands and thousands of other South Sudanese already at the UN gate, much like himself, uh, seeking refuge. Uh, so from there, um, we rewind. And we go back two years to this day what we've referenced to this incredible moment on July the 9th, 2011. Some of the folks in this room uh, were also fortunate to be there. Uh, but Simon wakes up early. And he's up before the sun rises. And he puts on a new suit and a new tie. And he boogies his way through the streets of Juba down to Freedom Square, where hundreds of thousands of other South Sudanese uh, are waiting, are excited. They are uh, nationals to be. Right? They're, they're there that day to watch uh, the South Sudanese flag go up the pole. And uh, Simon dances, and he sings, uh, and he calls out, South Sudan, oye. And, he, and there's a call and response. And, and Simon listens to the words of his leaders, uh, Salva Kiir and Riak Mashar and some of these other folks, and his expectations swell. And so right up front, as you say, we sort of frame the whole narrative arc of the book. Uh, and then we rewind to the beginning uh, and try to understand just how we got here. Two of the, the characters that you introduced uh, very early on are, are people that a lot of us have spent a lot of time trying to understand, uh, Riyak Mashar and Salva Kiir. Um, they're, I, I, you know, they're essentially characters in the book, just like Simon. So can you talk a little bit about why you decided to use that, that sort of lens to tell the story? Yeah. Um... It, it, isn't, it isn't my story. It's a South Sudanese story. And so um, in addition to uh, years working there in different capacities, I went back to South Sudan and sat down um, with the big men, um, uh, many of the so southern Sudanese elite who are largely responsible for what's happened, uh, and also a host of ordinary citizens. So we do meet Salva Kiir, uh, the president, um, and still the president. Uh, uh, in a chapter called The Accidental President, and Salva is thrust into the role of the presidency at a really existential moment for uh, South Sudan on the heels of Dr. John Garang, who I'm sure we'll come back to. Um, the next chapter is about Riyak Mashar, called The uh, uh, Rebel with a PhD, um, and who many of you know has a long and storied uh, political history in South Sudan, good, bad, and otherwise. Um, and so we do meet these characters that uh, animate um, uh, some of Sudan's uh, most formative events of the last few years uh, and have animated those events in, in some ways for far too long. Um, but we also meet the every man and the every woman. Um, and that was an important part of this. For me, I think Sudan and South Sudan's history has largely been told through the big men uh, and not through uh, the eyes of ordinary citizens. So I was incredibly fortunate uh, to go back and listen and to hear uh, stories uh, at length from a lot of different characters. So uh, we meet a young woman called Ayen, who, like so many others, is displaced during Sudan's long civil war. And of all places, she goes to take refuge in Khartoum in the north. And she marries there, and she has children, and she has a job, and she makes friends. Um, but like Simon and like so many others, excited by the prospect of independence, uh, she returns south. Uh, in an equally difficult journey in 2011 to bring her children home uh, to a country they've never set foot in. Um, we made a, a man called uh, James, uh, who's an ex-banker in South Sudan, who helps us 
uh, understand both the scope uh, um, of corruption in South Sudan, this cancer that was eating the state uh, before it was really born, um, but also the motivations. And I think there, and there's a broader story than the one you sometimes hear outside of South Sudan. And surely corruption has uh, totally devoured uh, the state and its fledgling institutions. Um, but I hope that you will wrestle with uh, some of the difficult moral questions in that chapter. They're not as black and white as some of this story otherwise seem. Um, lots of different characters. Um, Barack Obama shows up, even the Pope shows up. Uh, but um, I think you know it's it's a much more interesting story to understand it from those multiple pers perspectives, you know, and particularly the South Sudanese is their story. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's right, and I'm 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 ribbing you a little bit because you do show up in the story a yeah. lot, but I think that's also right to facilitate some of the storytelling. So, um, why did we have to learn about Zach in this book? Well, you don't learn. I don't think you learn much, but there's. Basically, I had done you know, lots of foreign policy and a lot of nerd writing um, uh, previously, and I went to start this book and tried to tell it uh, in that lens, and it didn't work very well. Mm. And you know, some of the best books that have been written, I got advice from some great authors on Africa, from Michaela Rong and from others. And uh, Emma's War is a book that many people know about, uh, South, or about Sudan, and actually they found it was a very uh, substantive, very well-written book. So I actually started this without ever using the word I. Mm. I was totally mortified, not my story, didn't want to be involved in any way, and I, uh, uh, I went to a writing residence with some other authors and some other journalists, and they told me, frankly, that I was nuts, hmm. that that is not how we tell stories, uh, that you, you were there. I was accidentally there for some of these critical moments. Uh, why are you trying to remove yourself? And most importantly, um, they said, uh, I doesn't have to mean me, and, and that allowed that was really important uh, and allowed me uh, to tell some first person vignettes or some entry points, formative experiences uh, uh, that I hope are entry points for readers to understand some of the larger themes that animate uh, the book. Okay, I'd like to sort of get to the meat of, of the piece, the thing that I think all of us who, who follow South Sudan have struggled with, which is the SPLM, right? This party, this liberation movement, this army, you know, has, has had a small and really powerful fan base here in Washington, D.C. Um, that had um, really put the, the group and its leaders on a pedestal. And they didn't really live up to that, right? They rigged elections, suppressed dissent, and obviously carried out or participated in this, you know, brutal civil war. So how did that happen? You know, why do you think that the SPLM, SPLM became uh, the government and the rebel group that we know today? Yeah. Um, so as Judd alludes, this book, in addition to the characters and the, and the narrative of South Sudan's modern history, um, it is one large chunk political autopsy. Um, and for me, that political autopsy, to do it justice, uh, uh, to try and uh, attempt this, doesn't begin in 2013. Um, it doesn't begin in 2011 at independence. It doesn't begin in 2005. Uh, I think you have to go back much further um, to its beginnings in the, in the 80s and into the 90s. Um, and so uh, I had my own views about this um, as a result of the, the time in South Sudan and, and the peace process that followed. But um, again, I wanted to go back and hear uh, from South Sudanese. So I sat with many of the SPLM's uh, leading men. And uh, they are, unfortunately, mostly men. Um, uh, and asked them what went wrong. And I, and I sat with their, their most ardent critics, uh, and I sat with a lot of ordinary South Sudanese. Um, and three answers, uh, three sort of broad categories emerge, um, which I'll preview now and, and are in the book, um, some of which are not necessarily new, new and, and are known by uh, a handful of people, but I think uh, they are new to a lot of people, and they are gaining uh, richness, they're gaining different texture, uh, they're evolving with the benefit of hindsight and critical distance. So um, one is the ethos of the movement, right? You alluded to the SPLM having um, developed a special relationship and really Dr. John Gareng himself uh, developing this special rela relationship. But um, unlike other liberation movements, if you look around Africa or even elsewhere in the world, um, 
this is not a movement that is doing a lot of providing for the people, right? All too often, rather than delivering food, um, they are uh, seizing food aid, right? They're recruiting child soldiers. Uh, they are oftentimes preying on the people uh, rather than supporting them. Um, and uh, so the ethos of the movement, let me back up, the ethos of the movement is first, uh, and that is, it's not a particularly democratic movement. Um, perhaps over learning the lessons of uh, liberation movements past, Dr. John Garang is holding this movement uh, with an iron fist, right? And he's assassinated some political rivals, and he's not building up the institutions um, or the structures that will necessarily outlive him. Um, and he believes that can be done later, uh, and ultimately, spoiler alert, as so many of you know, he tragically dies in a helicopter crash, and so there isn't much of a structure left to outlive him. Um, second is uh, a lack of a meaningful connection to the people. Um, this is what I was sort of alluding to. Um, and because there is this history, well, let me put it this way. Um, this is another thing that's not largely unseen to the outside, right? So too often the SPLM was seen as synonymous with South Sudan, uh, and many in Washington and outside uh, saw it as the main interlocutor. And actually, there are huge pockets of South Sudan that hated the SPLM. Mm -hmm. They wanted nothing to do with it. And in fact, if you look at the war today, if you look at the war that broke out in 2013 or the dynamics today, uh, that continues to be true. Um, so in addition to the, um, the, it's sometimes relationship with the people, it's, it's certainly not representative of the whole of Sudan or the whole of South Sudan. Um, and it's elite, uh, the, these members of the elite over time, and this is where the role of the US and Westerners come in, um, they become increasingly uh, detached from their own people and more and more accountable to a constituency of foreigners, uh, too often willing to back them at any price, uh, rather than accountable to their own people. So second is this lack of a meaningful connection to the people. Um, and third is party factionalism. So after John Garang uh, dies in a helicopter crash in 2005, um, again, largely unseen, uh, to the outside world or to the, to, uh, the constituencies that built up um, both in Europe and America, there's a really vicious battle for inheritance of the SPLM that's happening inside the party uh, between 2005 and 2011. Uh, and they kept a, a lid on it just barely, um, but this is uh, really uh, a cancer. Uh, it's really eating away at the party um, that's empowered and at a time when all hands are really needed on deck. And so uh, I think that is something that is, again, one of the things that's been uh, further understood uh, with the benefit of time. Can you talk a little bit more about the role of the US here? And the book is a critique, right? The book ultimately has a critique of the role of the US um, and the relationship with the SPLM. So you know, what happened? Why did, did we get it wrong? Yeah. Um, so t two things to frame this. Uh, I think there's, a, there's an epigraph that opens uh, chapter 22, which is called Love Lost. Um, and that's from um, one of the, the, the quote comes from one of the uh, most ardent supporters of the SPLM in this country. Um, and someone I really respect and who has really um, done some soul searching and reflection about what went wrong. Um, and he said, um, you can become close to someone, but still be a tough friend and we were never a tough friend. And, and I think that sums it up. But some context first. It's absolutely a critique, but uh, it isn't about pointing fingers in my view. I hope it's not, it's not about blame. I, I don't think that's uh, either interesting or worthwhile. I hope it is um, a critique that is about lessons learned, as I mentioned, what all of us, myself can, included, can learn from this uh, and, and how we think about this when we look at um, other conflicts. So. Um, I mentioned this relationship that John Garang largely builds uh, himself over the course of uh, the 1990s. And ultimately, I think, and we can get into the details if you want, but uh, over time, um, we get too close to the SPLM, uh, way too close to the SPLM. And there's a simplified narrative both about the North-South War uh, and about the SPLM's role in it. Um, I think there's an unqualified belief in the uh, righteousness of the cause, uh, and I think there's a moral compulsion to act. Um, and I think uh, that together with how this relationship started and how the policy posture 
kind of emerged ultimately leads to the space being warped, um, as I've alluded, in South Sudan among its elite, um, but also in Washington. Um, so I do think um, having adopted the underdog's cause with such zeal, um, uh, having leaned on the scales, uh, and having moved on too soon, I do think uh, the role of the West in the United States in particular deserves critical reflection, and I, and I hope to do that, some of that here. Um, again, uh, the role, South Sudan would not exist today if it weren't for the United States, and that's impo you know, critically important, that um, this was a, a righteous cause. There was real reason to back uh, the Southern Sudanese in their, in their fight for self-determination. Um, the United States and others provided critical food aid and other humanitarian humanitarian support uh, throughout generations of the struggle. Um, it helped end the war that the Sudanese and the South Sudanese couldn't uh, end on their own, and it helped uh, deliver this opportunity um, uh, for self-determination in South Sudan, which I think was justified. Um, but I do think along the way, the nature of that relationship um, uh, became problematic. And I think in order to understand why it unraveled and what happened there, um, we have to look at that. You know, the, the, what happens in South Sudan does belong first to the South Sudanese, but um, given the outside role played, outsized role played by the United States, um, I do think um, it's important for all of us together to have a conversation about what happened. And again, I hope this is one small contribution to that larger conversation. It does seem like we conflated the cause uh, with the people who, who were pushing it, right? Like there's a difference between, as you said, the objective and the underdog. and you know, on reflection, what, was there a better way to sort of disentangle those two things? I mean, a degree of triage was absolutely necessary, right? Like, these were awful governments in the North, and there was a, a cause to back. And as this, you know, that relationship gets close, uh, Darfur happens, right? And so um, we had supported, we had chosen sides, we had supported the South. Darfur happens, and the government in Khartoum uh, goes from an awful regime to genocidaires. Um, and um, this is something that uh, Ambassador Princeton Lyman and I, and I um, uh, who, to whom this book is dedicated, talked about at length, uh, and how that ultimately trained uh, our eyes on this awful regime in the North, uh, and that uh, may have been justified, but as a result, um, the white hats we'd given to the Southerners got even whiter. And so when it, when it, when it came back to South Sudan, uh, when attention, international came, attention came back to South Sudan in 2010 and 2011, um, again, I think we were uh, not willing enough, not ready enough to look at what was happening inside South Sudan. Uh, we were understandably concerned about uh, sovereignty and about assuring South Sudan's right to self-determination and preventing a war between North and South, um, but I think the mistake was uh, giving a free pass to uh, the SPLM and to the SPLM elites, and I, and I think uh, there was a way that we could have used both that relationship and that leverage to try and uh, ask more of them. Uh, I was listening to a, a podcast, I think it was about a year ago, with uh, Gail Smith, who was the USAID, USAID director and had worked African issues for a long time. And she had this, I think, interesting retrospective about how you assess uh, rebel groups and the way they may govern. And she said, we didn't take a close enough look at how SPLM was governing its own territory, right, during right. the period before the CPA and then certainly between the CPA and independence. And I, I just throw that out there because I think um, it's a useful framework when we're talking about rebel movements across uh, sub-Saharan Africa or elsewhere about what are they doing with the, with the populations that are under their uh, jurisdiction even before independence. And I think and I think she would take, you know, I don't, she's not really a character in this book, but she would also say, like, you know, that was something that I could have, yeah. could have thought about and, more deeply. And I apologize because we've backed into this a little bit, yeah. but this is about uh, Dr. John Grant coming to the United States, right? He's, he started this uh, uh, Marxist-Leninist movement uh, in, and led it in the 80s and 90s, and at the end of the Cold War, he finds out he's on the wrong side of history. And so he says, we have to go to Washington. And he comes to Washington and he, and he has help of supporters here and he builds a constituency and he takes uh, slavery uh, and racism to the Congressional Black Caucus and he takes religious persecution to uh, Republicans in Congress and, on, and to the Christian right and he takes human rights abuses uh, and famine to other advocacy groups uh, and he builds this incredible coalition that I referenced uh, across the political spectrum. 
Um, and Garang was a remarkable guy by all accounts, right? And people were taken with his really transformative vision for the future of Sudan, uh, and he had charisma. And you and I were talking about this earlier. He had mm -hmm. remarkable charisma. And so um, I think in many ways, people were put all their eggs in one basket. And, and there's a scene in the book where um, after jo John Garang uh, is killed in a car crash, or in a helicopter crash, excuse me, um, uh, Sal Vakir comes to Washington for the first time, and he has a meeting in the Oval Office. Um, and uh, the president and the, and the people around him, George Bush, are stunned. Uh, and one of them says, you know, upon reflection, uh, we did not know anyone else. Dr. John Garang was controlling this relationship. He was controlling the narrative. He did not want us to pay attention to what was happening inside uh, South Sudan. And when he died, uh, there was nothing left. So the relationship between the administration and Keir Warm, I think your book has a nice like sort of sequencing of showing how uh, President Bush and Keir, which start out with a pretty awful meeting, uh, or at least a, uh, I don't know. Shocking one. Shocking one. Um, and maybe you could talk a little about that. Um, that relationship changes, and, and the moment it's kind of these two bookends, you've got the warming of the relationship between President Bush and Keir, and then, um, and then this history that they've developed or they've inherited, and then uh, this moment in the Waldorf Astorian with yeah. President Obama, and that kind of gives you, sort of encapsulates the way in which the U.S. relationship changed with South Sudan. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I mean, Salva Keir had uh, three visits to the Oval Office um, uh, as head of a place that was not yet a country, right, uh, before independence. That's a lot of face time in an Oval Office for anybody, uh, much less a state that doesn't yet exist. Uh, and so there is, uh, you know, and that's reflective of the larger U.S. relationship that spans both parties and spans lots of interest groups. Um, but he hasn't, by 2011, by the time of independence, he has not met President Obama. And, and, and it's the Obama administration that really safeguards the referendum vote and, and delivers, helps deliver independence. Um, and so there is this uh, really seminal moment, I think, where Salva Kiir arrives in New York City in September uh, of 2011, just after independence, um, during the annual meeting of the UN General Assembly. And this is really South Sudan's coming out party. Right, they're celebrated uh, as the world's newest state. And so, um, as many of you know, uh, the US government sort of state takes over uh, the famed Waldorf Astoria Hotel uh, every s September and makes it its headquarters, at least until recently. Right. Um, and so Salva Kiir and his entourage uh, make their way up the east side of Manhattan uh, early one evening, and they arrive at the Waldorf Astoria and the hotel, and they're ferried up to uh, a conference room to meet with President Obama um, and uh, his team. Um, pause here, there's a bit of context. As surely some of you know, um, when South Sudan opted out months earlier uh, from Sudan, um, it left uh, many others uh, remaining inside Sudan who were fighting for the same cause, who had the same grievances, who had fought on some of the front lines, the worst battles of the Civil War. Um, these are brothers in arms, and they're frankly left behind, right? They're marooned inside an unreformed Sudan. They don't have the opportunity uh, that the Southern Sudanese did. And so the SPLM um, doesn't want to hang these guys out to dry. And so they are sending weapons across the border uh, to their former um, brothers in arms, as I say, um, uh, to continue the struggle. And this is a problem. Um, because North and South at this time were very near to going back to war. And these are two uh, sovereign states now, and it's very inflammatory, and it's the worst kept secret in the region. For those of you that were there at the time, everybody knew this was happening. Uh, the Obama administration surely knew it was happening and had satellite imagery that it was happening. Um, so prior to that meeting, um, uh, the Americans uh, meet with their South Sudanese counterparts just days before the Waldorf Astoria meeting. And they say, uh, we know this is happening. Uh, we understand why. We can work on a solution with you. But please don't lie to the president. Please don't lie to President Obama. You know where this is going. Uh, so the meeting starts, and they uh, sit around this oval table. And there are pleasantries exchanged. And congratulations on becoming the world's newest state. Um, and then there's talk of the road ahead and continued partnership. And it's a mostly light meeting. And at the end of the meeting, Obama raises the issue and you know, says something to the effect of, uh, these weapons uh, coming across the border are a problem. You're now a sovereign state. Um, this has got to stop. And we've got, um, we've got proof. So there's a long pregnant pause. 
and all eyes in the room focus on the man in the big black cowboy hat. And he looks back across the table at President Obama and says, uh, Mr. President, if your satellites are telling you that we're sending weapons across the border, you should probably check on your satellites. And this is with the administration and with the president that have just helped them deliver uh, the ultimate prize, right? And so it was in that moment, I think, uh, uh, really reflective of how quickly the nature of, or how quickly that relationship had changed. Um, and again, um, as Princeton Lyman uh, said, uh, I think it's the first time that um, some of us in that room and, and some in Washington understood um, just how badly interests had been mistaken for friendships, right? And it's about the dangers of, th of that relationship and, and attachment in foreign policy to this cause. And I think uh, the fact that it happened so fast uh, was telling. So I want to try to focus us on on the, the war and the peace process, which you played a big role in, and I think will will set us up nicely for the Q and A, because I think people will have a lot of questions about um, the conflict and where we're going. But um, you fly into Juba, beginning of the beginning of the war. Can you talk us take us to that moment and the, what your view? What was at stake? Yeah, the stakes were incredibly high. Um, so this is December of 2013, and and uh, Special Envoy Booth, who's here by the way. Um, and I fly to Juba to try and, on the back of this historic relationship, try and uh, press and urge and cajole and encourage uh, Salva Kiir to stop the violence and to try and put this back in a box um, before things unravel, right? And, and the violence has just begun. Um, and uh, we fly out uh, shortly thereafter and we're gonna return to the United States and no one at this point really has a full grasp of just how bad it is. Um, and so uh, no one has really an, an idea and we get a phone call from uh, the Secretary of State who's back in Washington and, and people are starting to get uh, a clearer sense and intelligence reporting of just how bad it is. Uh, and the Secretary tells us to go back. Um, and so uh, we played a very small role together with lots of other diplomats from the region um, over the next nine weeks, essentially trying to put together a peace process and try to get it off the ground. And so this peace process does begin in, in neighboring Ethiopia and the stakes are incredibly high. Um, there's a chance to uh, sort of recapture the promise of South Sudan to, uh, uh, in this moment of crisis, maybe to help uh, address some of the structural flaws uh, that led to this breakdown uh, and hopefully um, help the South Sudanese uh, return to you know the path that uh, everyone saw for them and um, I do go into quite a bit of detail in the book about the peace process I'm not sure where that peace process will fit in the grander scope of history but I do think um, zooming in close there uh, to the individuals to the themes to the tenor of those discussions and what was happening uh, do give us a sense of South Sudan's past present and in some ways uh, its future with current peace efforts um, so the stakes were incredibly high, and I think the, the, the big thing to note there is that we, along with others, uh, tried very hard to make that uh, process an inclusive one. Um, and for weeks and weeks and weeks, there was an attempt uh, to try and bring in youth and try and bring in women and try and bring in other political parties and try and bring in a lot of those people that did not have voices um, uh, together uh, with the guys with guns. Right, because it was the guys with guns, and, and they were mostly SPLM factions that that broke the place. And so there was an opportunity uh, to create a kind of inclusive, multi-stakeholder process. Um, and for a whole host of reasons, uh, it failed, and and we failed in in trying to make that happen. And as a result, over time, um, as you'll see in the book, um, it returns to uh, a too narrow a process uh, among the same uh, elites that. Um, uh, I think we all agree helped uh, uh, are, are the cause or the reason this place unraveled, and I think that says a lot about uh, South Sudan in the short and medium term as well. In the book, you grapple with a question I think lots of people have thought about, which is, um, did the civil war mean that that Sudan's independence was a mistake? I mean, yeah. I, I personally, I told you this earlier, Zach, I always find it interesting when I go to South Sudan meetings, someone always says, well, if Dr. John Garang hadn't died, we'd be in a different place. But it's all about the same question, right? They're all questioning the trajectory that we're on. So was it a mistake? Could this have unfolded differently? 
Uh, I do not think independence was a mistake. And this is the million dollar question that comes up every time. Um, I don't think independence was a mistake. Um, and I think in the wake of the Civil War, as you allude to, uh, there was a lot of gotcha journalism. There was a lot of fingers pointed. We said, ah, see United States and see you supporters. Uh, this was all a huge mistake and a huge blunder. And I don't think that's right. And I think that fails to understand um, both the context uh, and the likely alternatives to secession at the time. So um, first, the likely alternatives. Had the South Sudanese at that time in 2011 uh, been denied this right to self-determination for which they had struggled for generations, uh, I believe pretty firmly, and, and I know some of the people in this room do as well, that a new and larger war would have ensued um, between um, Khartoum and Juba and between uh, two factions that now are fueled by oil money and have much, much bigger weapons. Yeah. Right? And that war, I think, could, could very well have engulfed uh, much of the region. Uh, so that is one. And two is uh, the context, and that is self-determination. If you look at South Sudan at the time of independence, you look at its history, I mean, it's hard to make a clearer case for a people that have been denied a chance to determine their own political destiny. Um, you know, no development, no roads, no schools, no opportunity, no voice in government. Southern Sudanese had for so long uh, felt like second-class citizens in their own country. And so I think that uh, supporting them in self-determination was right and was justified. Um, I don't think independence was a mistake. I think the more valuable, the more pertinent critiques and the more pertinent discussion, uh, discussions are about expectations uh, and about exec execution. And I think the, the real question is um, what could have been done differently uh, to put in place the foundations for a viable state. The conflict is continuing, right? I mean, Karen Mashar have a new peace agreement. They're still fighting in the Equatorias. The agreement is still narrow. Reports are that as many as 400,000 are dead. And you still ended on an optimistic note. So why? Yeah, um, I do. I, I do end the book uh, with a note of optimism, and, it, and it's uh, a genuine one. Um, but it depends on your time horizon, mm. right? And I think too often. Uh, we think about this in six months or 12 months or 18 month funding cycles and we don't think about it, uh, I would argue more, ris more realistically in 10 and 15 and 20 year terms. Um, and I think that actually uh, one of the most important ingredients in South Sudan's ultimate uh, success or prosperity uh, in the long term um, is generational change. And I know that's not a particularly sexy answer, especially with some policymakers who are looking for tools in the short term. But I do think that perspective is important. And so the last chapter of the book um, is about a young man named Kong, who I met on my very first trip to South Sudan 10 years ago or more. And uh, he's a remarkable young man, a remarkable individual who lives um, deep in the New Air heartland. And after dozens and dozens of conversations with people two and three times his age, I'm really struck with Kong's ideas. Um, he's got ideas about how to reform the pay payment system at the local level and what are the uh, social reconciliation measures that will work and why the others that have failed at a state level and how do we translate uh, you know, institutional change. He's a remarkable uh, guy. He's got remarkable ideas. And we have this discussion and, and you know, we, the, the obvious question is why doesn't he play a bigger role? Why doesn't he step up? Why doesn't he run for office? Uh, and, and the reality is that there's a ceiling that he can't crack. Right, this, this SPLM ruling elite, this liberation class uh, that delivered independence comes into office and has a sense of entitlement. And uh, it's really hard for young people like Kong uh, to break through. So fast forward to two, two thousand, late 2016, I fly back to uh, South Sudan and I go to visit Kong yeah. and travel deep into the New Air heartland to a place called Wat. And uh, we meet again and Kong, um, uh, despite his attempts, is, is like so many people embroiled in the messy politics uh, of this war, uh, but he's doing his best to try and uh, make a difference nonetheless. And so we wrestle with this over the course of two days, uh, whether or not uh, he wants to stay and try to make a difference despite a failed peace agreement and, and what's happening, or does he want to pick up and leave? Right? And it's, a, I mean, how convenient for me to, uh, you know, plop in for four for 48 hours and, and uh, you know, why this guy's wrestling with such a decision. But Kong has even more advanced ideas about what has happened and he's, and he's a leader in his community now 
Um, but he's wrestling with this decision of does he stay or does he go? And uh, I do think that there are a lot of Kongs in South Sudan. And that's not, I don't say that as a cliche. I think much like Simon uh, and many others, uh, Kong was educated in a refugee camp in neighboring Kenya. And uh, the silver lining of that uh, was that he got an education that he would not otherwise have received in South Sudan. And he grew up Kong and Nuer. He grew up alongside young men and women from the Dinka community and from the Azandi community and from the Shilo community. And they have different ideas about the future. And so uh, I do think there are a lot of those people, uh, both in the diaspora, uh, but also uh, back in South Sudan who are uh, looking to the future. Um, I think it's gonna continue to be very, very difficult in the short term and, and very messy. Um, but I am optimistic about it, and it's because of uh, people like Kong. And I think part of our policy answer, our policy response, in addition to what we should be doing in the near term, uh, the sort of short and medium term tactical um, policy interventions, is to think uh, about investing in 30-somethings and, and to start thinking about this in much longer terms and in, ter and in terms of generational change. And I don't think we're very good at that. I don't think we're set up to do that very well, and I think it's... Uh, one of the things I, I hope we can think more seriously about. Well, maybe that's a great way to open it up to the audience. I've monopolized your time. Um, so why don't we see who's got some questions. Uh, Kat will bring the mic over, but Travis, and yeah. No problem. Thank you. Uh, my name is Travis Atkins. I'm an adjunct professor in the African Studies Department in Georgetown, host of the On Africa podcast. Zach, quick question for you. You mentioned our beloved Ambassador Princeton Lyman, and I was wondering if you could reflect for a few moments on the special envoy relationship, the arc, the history, the reflections, or the, excuse me, the effectiveness of it uh, from Danforth through Gratian and mm -hmm. Richardson and so forth. Yeah, I've gotten this question a lot over the last month as we think about things now. And um, I want to say first, uh, again, to acknowledge uh, there is one special envoy in the room um, who can probably say as much or more about this than me, and that is Donald Booth, who I worked for for several years and um, who made a really important uh, and sizable contribution. And I want to uh, uh, mention uh, Lois in the back here and say hello. Um, uh, Princeton Lyman sadly departed us. Um, not too long ago, and, and his wife Lois is here, um, and he was uh, a really important mentor uh, to me as well. Um, the role of the Special Envoy, this has been hotly debated in, in Washington, not least when it comes to Sudan. I do think there's an important role. I think it's an interesting tool uh, that can be used in certain circumstances. Uh, it certainly proliferated. It certainly got popular. Um, I had a talk yesterday at Georgetown University with Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who was the Assistant Secretary for Africa uh, during the time of several of these Special Envoys, and, and she's opposed to it. Right, structurally, um, um, uh, and there's, you know, we could have a beer after and go into the details of why. I think the issue is, um, do you have somebody uh, in the U.S. government? And I think it's a particularly pertinent question right now. Do you have somebody in the in the U.S. government who is empowered, right? Who has political capital? Who has uh, the necessary backing from the administration uh, at large in Washington to go and and make policy and do diplomacy? I, I'm less concerned or less caught up in the debate of what the title of that person is. Um, I do think it's important that we have that person uh, or those people, um, and I think we're lacking it right now. I just want to say one thing. I only knew Princeton really in the Nigeria context when he was ambassador, but I, you know, he's had a, a career that expands just the Sudans. And uh, just recently, I, I reread his book, Partner in History, about South 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 Africa. And I think if people want to. Uh, see his genius in diplomacy, I really recommend it. Thanks. Uh, Alex Pick over at uh, Johns Hopkins Sites. I guess, you know, I um, first thank you. I'm excited to read the book. Um, you know, your comments about lessons learned, I think, resonate with me particularly. And I wanted to push you a little bit harder on that. There's a kind of paradox in, in what you've been saying. The United States is, on the one hand, instrumental in uh, South Sudan's independence, and on the other hand, partially responsible, if I hear you right, for what takes place afterward. And, and you pinpointed you know, the, the lack of pushback, the lack of thinking about the SPLM's structure and how it was governing internally, a kind of clientelism and oversimplification narrative. Um, and I'm very sympathetic to all of those being problems, uh, but I also wonder, from a bureaucratic perspective, if simplicity and clientelism isn't 
structurally necessary to the fact that the United States played as, uh, as great a role as it did in Sudan. In other words, take out the clientelism, uh, take out the simplicity of the narrative that was constructed around Sudan over a 25-year period. Does the United States actually support independence in Sudan? So uh, I agree with you on the surface of it. It'd be great if we could have done all of those things better. But I wonder, had we done them better, would we have gotten to where we got? Um, I agree with all of that. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, I'll, 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 I'll betray Alex here that he read the epilogue uh, multiple times and we argued over this question already. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a fair question. Uh, you know, it, I think basically what you're saying is if we don't have this close relationship with the SPLM, um, does this happen in quite the same way? And I think there's a couple things to think about here. Um, I don't think it has to be that black and white. I think our understanding with and our relationships with South Sudanese actors could have been more nuanced. I don't think they had to be so personified in John Garang or his immediate successors, um, one. Uh, two, I think as a result of the CPA, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005, the nature of that agreement, um, uh, there was a choice there, right? There was a choice uh, to support this at a, as a two-party agreement. And in some ways that was probably, you, you, I think there's a strong argument to say that was necessary, um, but it also elevated those two parties. It elevated both the NCP and the SPLM's position domestically in their own countries or regions, right? So that happens very early. Um, and I also think, again, you, you got to go back pretty far uh, as to how and why this relationship began. And I think it, it's at this interesting nexus of, of American foreign policy where we have these uh, kind of uh, principled-based, human rights-oriented interventions in our foreign policy. And uh, th that's, that's driving a lot of this in South Sudan and you have a, a near complete lack of national security interest. And it's in this kind of unique space that uh, the posture and the relationship between the United States and, and, and the SPLM or South Sudan begins. And over time, whether that's in Congress or among um, advocacy groups or elsewhere, I, I think that's where a, a simplified narrative begins. And over time, by the time of 2011, I think the policy options, um, even for the envoys, uh, the special envoys are already limited. And I talk about in the book where you have uh, Richard Williamson and you have uh, Princeton Lyman and you have other uh, envoys on both sides of the aisle um, who are feel constricted, who are hearing from um, the advocacy community, who are, fearing, uh, who are hearing from the SPLM supporters. And the SPLM, by the way, knew very well how to activate those groups. Um, uh, they're hearing uh, from them, and it's restricting their ability to do, do diplomacy. It's restricting their ability to engage. And I think it's important that that was happening in both Republican and Democratic administrations. And so um, I hear what you're saying. I, I wonder. It's hard. It's a tough co counterfactual to know if we get to the CPA or if we get uh, to independence. I certainly don't think um, the question has to be that black and white or that simple. I, th I think we could have, at the same time, um, demanded things of the SPLM um, I think we could have broadened our relationships in a way that the SPLM didn't feel uh, like it was uh, a kid in the candy store. Um, I, I think those things could have happened um, at the same time that we're dealing with the North-South issue. And that's not easy. And I'm not pretending in any way that there weren't difficult, hard policy choices at every stage of it. Um, but I do think as we think about uh, uh, partnering with clients, whether it's in Syria, uh, as you worked on, or other uh, environments, I do think uh, this is one we should look closely at. Other questions in the back? I'm really excited to read your book. I've lived in South Sudan a couple times, the first time right after the last war ended, and the second time during the referendum and everything. Thanks so much for coming. Um, so as a follow-on to that question, when you're talking about complexity and where we should or shouldn't have delved deeper, I understand the power that we got from simplifying the conflict up front when we were moving towards just getting the CPA in place. But later on, around 2010-11, it was very clear that opposition candidates, journalists, anyone who wasn't towing the party line was being intimidated. They were being, there was a lot happening um, in the six months leading up to the referendum. Do you think that at that point, or I mean, even a year or two before, when it was clear that that was the direction things were going in, that we should have pushed for more 
Yes. More of a stick approach. And how so? What could the wedges More of a what, sorry? What were the additional sticks we could have used? How could we have... Yeah, no, I'm not sure they're necessarily... I, I get what you're saying. Uh, the, uh, I think the question is, could we have uh, altered or corrected that relationship in 2010 and 2011? Because at the time, um, as you referenced, um, a lot of what the SPLM is doing is deeply undemocratic. Mm -hmm. Right, they are rigging elections, they're choosing their own candidates, they're suppressing independent, uh, all of this stuff is happening. The opposition leader who is um, uh, interviewed in this book at length is beaten up and his front teeth are knocked out because he's um, asking for amendments on the constitution. There's a lot of this stuff that's going on in South Sudan, um, but you were there. And I imagine this is a, a surprise to some of the people here or some of the people watching online because I don't think that narrative was uh, widely known and where it, and where it was known um, and and I talked to a lot of people in the book about this uh, where it was known it was suppressed because there was a belief that well any criticism of the south will indirectly help the north right and north and south were very close to returning to war right and so uh, that's one piece of it there it was like anything you do right now that could imperil the referendum any criticism that's unhelpful Right, you and many others were there. Um, I put out a report of when I was working with the International Crisis Group at the time um, that highlighted a lot of this, and people uh, were not happy about it. They didn't really want to hear it, um, and so I think that's I think that's uh, one piece of it. Um, but again, I think uh, I don't think you can pick up that the, the answer to that question in 2010 or 2011. I think so much of that of that relationship goes back. Uh, much, much further. And interestingly, I go out and meet with a, uh, a gentleman many of you may know, uh, Pagan Amum, uh, the party front man, the, the secretary general of the SPLM, who was the chief spin doctor. Uh, and I sat down with him for this political autopsy and I said, you were rigging elections, you were suppressing these other parties, uh, you were picking your own candidates, all of these things. And I, you know, I was attempting to provoke uh, the response I thought I was gonna get. And he said, yep. He said, yep, that's right. We were. Um, so I do think, uh, the, the, you know, there are two answers to it, and I've kind of alluded to both of them. I do think at that moment, just before independence, when we're delivering, we're flying boxes of referendum ballots uh, around the country, and, and we're very close to, like, I do think there's an opportunity there where it doesn't have to be sticks, um, but we had such a relationship that we could have asked for more in terms of uh, democratic space or uh, in terms of oil money or in terms of all these things. Um, again, I don't want to oversimplify that because it was a very tense moment. Um, again, but for me, I think uh, the equally important answer and the one we don't um, often have enough of a discussion is uh, 5, 10, 20 years earlier. John Tanza, I'm a journalist covering South Sudan. We, we communicated several times. Hi, John. Thanks for putting your experience with South Sudan on record. I was just reading the book and wondering at the same time, during the conflict in 2013 up to 2014, Uganda sort of like played a double role, a meddler, and at the same time sitting at uh, IGAD, deciding on what to do with South Sudan. You didn't touch a lot on that. Could there be any reasons why? You didn't get to the end of this fat book because it's in there. <laughs> I mean, it, it's there, but I was just wondering from U.S. Uh, policy point of view, why was Uganda allowed to do that? Meddle in the conflict and also sit at the table to find a solution? Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, maybe the most vigorous debate uh, within the U.S. government at the time uh, was about the role of Uganda. And there were... Uh, let's say, strong views all around uh, about its role. So this is, uh, for those that don't know, uh, you know, I, I don't want to go too much, too far in the weeds here, but uh, when the war begins, uh, EGAD steps in and we and many others support EGAD to take the role as uh, a peace mediator to try and negotiate an end to this uh, very rapidly unfolding conflict. Um, and at the same time, very quickly, um, you know, there's a question here about the role of frontline states in mediation processes anywhere. And I think that's another thing that is applicable from South Sudan's case elsewhere, and it's something I teach in a class um, on this. And that is, uh, do the is the value brought by frontline states? Uh, the relationships, uh, uh, the know-how, uh, the, the desire not to see economic spillover or refugee spillover from a neighboring country, it, is that 
uh, does that uh, bring important value to a mediation process, or do, that, do the immediate interests of those players um, uh, outweigh that in a negative way? And I think um, I would argue, and um, uh, it's not all in this book, I, I wrote a separate paper for IPI uh, on this question, um, and the title of that paper is A Poisoned Well. Um, because I think the, the role of the regional players uh, really uh, ultimately poisoned the peace process um, and limited the uh, outcome uh, of it. And Uganda is first and foremost. So when uh, EGAD takes the mantle uh, of negotiating, it isn't much uh, long after that Uganda steps in on uh, chooses sides in the war. Right? They come in first to protect the airport and, pr and protect uh, a sort of uh, counter-offensive in which a lot of more, a lot more civilians would have died, and it could have exacerbated the war even more in the medium term, or in the short term. And so, uh, I think many in Washington and elsewhere uh, saw that as an important first step uh, in preventing, uh, you know, a huge calamity. Uh, but very quickly, for those that don't know, Uganda starts fighting on behalf of the government. And it's not only protecting uh, installations, it, it's inflating the government's own sense of its position in the war. It's uh, flying sorties deep into opposition uh, territory. It's dropping cluster bombs, all sorts of things. And so I think the role of the Uganda is, is uh, second to none in, in the war that followed. Um, I don't think we necessarily got it right. Um, but there were, again, uh, very hard policy choices all around. Um, um, that's a long and storied uh, relationship with uh, President Museveni in Uganda. And um, there were attempts, there were multiple attempts, and they're detailed in the book, to try and get him to rein it in um, uh, and to use his influence, particularly over President Kiir, to alter the course of uh, the war in its earliest stages. Um, he was not uh, deterred, unfortunately. We probably have time for just uh, one more question. Uh, thank you, Zach. My name is Lam Jock, uh, South Sudanese. Uh, came to this country when I was a teenager in the 90s. Grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. Hi, ma'am. Went to school there. Went back in 2010. Spent like the rest of the years there until 2017. Uh, I was one of the people that went back and actually handled the uh, the IDP's program, living from the north to the south. We were in Khartoum for four months, taking over half a million people back home. Forward to 2013, war broke out. Uh, a lot of people died. Uh, most of us escaped through good luck and made it to the UN and, you know, peace agreement was established in Addis. We actually met there on the side in Addis in 2014. Um, but fast forward, to 20, fast forward to 2016, when the, the president, the first vice president of the state house, something happened. The clear was replaced by somebody that the president kid picked. Um, do you think there was a good opportunity in 2016 that could have at least saved the peace agreement? Could the US at the time played a crucial role, knowing what happened in 2013, knowing what has happened from 2013 up to 2016, after the peace agreement was signed in 2015? Could the US have done that any different? Could the US have done, could, could they have? Uh, help at least contain the situation by maybe pursuing the president. And by the way, did, did, as an expert on South Sudan, do you feel like President Kiir has been um, misunderstood on, on his stance and intention in South Sudan? Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Let me um, maybe take the first one. Um, so the, the peace agreement breaks down in July of 2016. Uh, essentially a year after it's signed and before it's really begun to be implemented, for those that don't know. Um, I was uh, outside of the U.S. government at that time, so I'm not privy to the conversations or the decisions. Uh, I know it was a very hard choice, right? Riek Mashar is essentially uh, chased out of the peace agreement, and it really takes a leg out of the deal. Um, I, I think there are probably uh, points to debate about the uh, tactical policy response at that time. Um, I think it comes in a larger context of uh, the challenges to that agreement uh, on its own. The fact that it had been narrowed uh, to an agreement mostly among uh, two and a half uh, factions, that there were very real problems with the security uh, arrangements despite the efforts, uh, the best efforts of, of both uh, the U.S. government and many others to try and make it work. Uh, I, I think um, there were, there were going to be cracks in any case. Um, 
was the decision to sort of accept that government um, a good one? I think that's debatable. And I do think it comes in a context of, uh, this is, comes at the uh, very near the end of the Obama administration um, and uh, a new administration is coming in and it, it's a very hard choice. So I, I don't have a good answer uh, as to that policy decision. Um, I, uh, I had my reservations about it at the time, but I think it's, uh, I think it's debatable. Well, um, I know we could ask questions about South Sudan all afternoon, but unfortunately we're gonna have to wrap up. Let me thank Zach again for coming today. And let me just say that um, I was really surprised by this book. As you said, you're a policy guy. I know you're in the policy context, but it's, it's written with incredible pacing and verve, and it's an enjoyable read. Forget the policy, forget the story of South Sudan. It's an enjoyable read with a human face to it. Um, but I think that if you are interested in South Sudan and its history, this is a fantastic book. If you are like me and had been in policy meetings and have been following this, it's an incredible opportunity for reflection. I think that's what I got the most out of it. Thinking about what could have been done differently, and, but also thinking about why things happen. You know, we run, we're running all the time during in policy process, and those of us who do this sort of programmatic stuff, and I think this book uh, has it's only a couple years old, but I think, you know, in terms of the conflict, but there's a great reflection here. So I want to thank you for that opportunity. Let me give you the last word, Zach. Uh, I just want to say thanks as well, both to Judd and Kat and everybody at CSIS, uh, to Lois, uh, to Special Envoy Booth, and the others in his role, role there who were in the trenches uh, uh, through much of this. Um, and uh, there's a few people online, uh, Megan McGuire and a few others that I want to thank. Um, and above all, the gentleman in the back here, Mr. Ali Vergi, who uh, was an intellectual counterpart of mine through uh, most of my uh, time in South Sudan and who has as good a, or better answers on all these questions uh, than I um, and who read several drafts of this book. Uh, I'm deeply indebted to him. So uh, thanks, Ali, and thanks, uh, everybody, for coming out. I really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to your feedback on the book. Thank you. Thanks.